Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar in our four-part webinar plus workshop series. Today's webinar is titled, Maximizing Your Impact. This webinar will examine how the impact of your research work can be measured through examining indexes, social media, citations, and more. My name is Chad Krause. I'm an associate professor at the University of Kansas, a licensed architect, and I'm also on the editorial board for TAD, the Journal of Technology, Architecture Plus Design. Today, I'll be moderating this webinar. Thank you for joining us. TAD is an international peer-reviewed journal of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and published by Taylor & Francis. The journal is dedicated to the advancement of scholarship in the field of building technology with a focus on the impact, translation, and integration of technology in architecture and design. The journal features articles on primary research in emerging materials, construction techniques, design integration, structures, building systems, energy, environmental design, information technology, digital fabrication, sustainability and resilience, project delivery, the history and theory of technology, and building technology education. For today's webinar, we have selected a group of three experts to discuss the dissemination and promotion of architectural research. They represent a wealth of experience and leadership. We are pleased to share these exemplars with you today. Our first panelist, Barbara Opar, is an embedded architectural librarian at Syracuse University with over 40 years of experience. Barbara is active in the profession and the author of several book chapters and articles and numerous book reviews peer commentaries, and blog entries. Barbara received the 2015 Distinguished Service Award from the Association of Architecture School Librarians, chaired the Architecture Corps Reference Task Force, and most recently helped create the fifth edition of the AASL Core Periodicals List. She will be sharing with us an overview of strategies for maximizing the impact of architectural research. Our second presenter, Rose Orcutt, is the University Librarian's Liaison for Students, Faculty, and Staff at the University at Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning and the Art Department. Rose offers reference and research consultation services, collection development, and provides support for research and teaching. She is currently serving as the Vice President, President-Elect of the Association of Architectural School Librarians. She recently published the paper Citation Analysis and Tenure Metrics in Art, Architecture, and Design-Related Disciplines in Art Documentation, Journal of the Art Librarian Society of North America. She will be providing a deeper dive into citation analysis and alt metrics in the design disciplines. Our third presenter, Dr. Mabub Rashid, is a professor of architecture at the University of Kansas and a registered architect. He is an expert in the theories and methods of architectural research with a focus on the structures of built form and space. He uses innovative spatial and social network, fractal, and statistical analysis techniques, along with more traditional research techniques, to study the effects of built form and space on behavior, psychology, society, and culture in office, healthcare, and urban environments. In collaboration with his colleagues, Dr. Rashid has worked on numerous funded research projects, and has published widely in reputable journals. His major publications include over 70 peer-reviewed articles, 50 of them as the sole author or main author. His recent book, The Geometry of Urban Layouts, compares more than 100 cities around the world using rigorously defined metrics for such important urban qualities as accessibility, complexity, continuity, compactness, and granularity. As an oft often cited scholar, he will be speaking about approaches to maximizing architectural research impacts and the future of research assessment in the field. This is Barbara Opar. I'm the librarian for architecture at the Syracuse University Libraries, and I've been doing that job for quite a long time. I was given a set of questions, and I'm going to try to address them. The questions are, what are the relevant impact metrics for scholars in the design fields? How is architectural research similar or dissimilar to other fields in terms of measuring impact? How important are impact factors? What other methods exist? 
since these questions are intertwined, I will address them together, but in the order noted above. My comments will focus on the discipline of architecture and its variables, as this is the field with which I am most familiar. I would have to begin by stating that there is no formal agreement on how to track scholarly impact in the arts and humanities, nor is there general agreement on what should be tracked. My colleague, Rose Orcott of the University of Buffalo, a fellow presenter in the webinar, and Meyer Gervitz of the New Jersey Institute of Technology, wrote what I believe to be the definitive article on citation analysis and tenure metrics for this field. It was published in Art Documentation, Volume 35, Fall 2016. So I defer to them as authorities. But I will nonetheless briefly address my impressions of scholarship in architecture. As you can see above, I mentioned arts and humanities research. Part of architectural research does fall into the arts and humanities, especially architectural history and theory. Where does that leave design? Many new faculty are leaning toward technology-based research. So I will try to com comment on impact factors there as well. The good news is that for that focus, most metrics are biased towards STEM. Metrics measure and quantify. You will hear the term bibliometrics used. Citation analysis became popular in the mid-1960s with the rise of products like the Science Citation Index, which enable tracking of previous research on a topic. But Mike Thelwall's and Maria Delgado's article in the Journal of Documentation from 2015 notes flaws in this approach, such as lack of a way to denote quality. They remind us that furthering the discipline is a primary goal of arts and humanities research. Creativity and originality are important. Further, they remind us that quantity may suggest reach, but does not testify to significance. They argue against high citation counts in the arts and humanities, stating that unlike the sciences, these counts do not necessarily reflect peer opinions. What measurements are relevant to design? In the article referenced before, Meyer Gervitz and Rose Orcutt argue that no one metric reflects impact in the design disciplines. A combination does, however, provide a fuller picture. Citation counts can be important, but most often are not timely. The delay in publication and indexing is significant. The H index measures both scholarly output and impact. It is used by both the Web of Science and Google Scholar. Web of Science is a subscription-based resource and weighted both toward research grounded in the sciences as well as toward more senior scholars. A resource guide from Cornell University describes this indicator clearly and you can see it below. The H-Index. Smago tracks the H-Index and I've noted a link below. Architectural educators may be surprised by this list. The list of journals valued in the design studio does not match up well with the list of titles with a high H index. I was a member of the AASL committee, which produced the latest, that is the fifth edition of the core list of architecture periodicals. We certainly took Smago into consideration, but we also relied on a number of other factors, such as the breadth of scope, database indexing, especially by the Avery Index, format, print, and electronic, geographical scope of coverage, image quality when applicable, length of the articles, notable contributors, type of graphic documentation, that is, plans and sections. These were considered to be important for schools of architecture. I am not sure that these factors are always looked at that closely by other sources. The Smago list is weighted toward the sciences, so the Journal of Building Performance Simulation has a high H index of 23, as does Architectural Science Review. Architectural Design comes in with a 13, and Harvard Design Magazine has a 3. What is Smago? Smago Journal Rank is a measure of the influence of scholarly journals in the sciences. It accounts for both the number of citations received by journals as well as the perceived importance or prestige of the journal. 
A journal's SJR is a numeric value indicating the average number of weighted citations received during a selected year per document published in that journal during the previous three years. Yep. <laughs> High SJR values are meant to indicate greater journal prestige. The next three images that you're seeing are actually a list in title order of Smuggle SJR ranks. Web of Science is considered to be an authoritative, multidisciplinary abstract and citation database spanning every discipline. It connects publications and researchers through citations and controlled indexing. It also contains current and res retrospective coverage in the sciences, social sciences, arts, and humanities. Included as well are the indexes that I've noted here. However, while certain SU faculty working in the area of building performance are listed and cited, their counts are not high. So this indicator needs to be added to others when considering faculty for appointment, reappointment or tenure. Scopus is a similar subscription-based product. It is the largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature, scientific journals, books, conference proceedings, and patents. It includes research output in the fields of science, technology, medicine, social sciences, and arts and humanities. Scopus features smart tools to track, analyze, and visualize research. I'm sure you're all familiar with Google Scholar. Besides being freely available, it is much broader based than Web of Science or Scopus. Google Scholar allows the author to create and maintain their own profile. It was first launched in 2004. Oftentimes, the full text of the article is readily available on Google Scholar. RG Index. Repositories are another way of making research available. I will be talking more about scholarly and institutional repositories, but first I want to talk about ResearchGate and the RG Index. ResearchGate is a commercial social networking site that is considered academic with over 3 million users since its 2008 founding. It appears to be better known than Academia EDU, perhaps because of its STEM focus. Registration requires an institutional email or a referral from a publisher. Besides being a commercial enterprise, ResearchGate has in recent years been sued by publishers like Elsevier for copyright infringement. Unlike institutional repositories, there is little monitoring of what papers and versions are being added. Next topic is journal publication acceptance rates. Publication acceptance rates vary by the specific journal. Those journals with lower acceptance rates are generally considered more prestigious. When made public, this information might be included on the publisher's page of the journal issue or at the publisher's website. However, calculation of acceptance rates varies. Some journals count all submissions and others only those articles reviewed. It may also depend on the typical number of articles and pages of the issue and how many pages were received for review. Article downloads. Some sources like ResearchGate allow researchers direct and easy access to these numbers. Measuring downloads allows the researchers to see usage patterns early on. However, one should wonder how many downloads actually result in citations. While downloads help contribute to a scholar's profile, they should not be taken completely at face value. Many factors contribute to this count, including the actual topic, timeliness of the research, search strategy, the window being considered, and even the actual titles in the database. Additionally, downloads are not generally considered to be an indication of quality. Our next topic is the social media. Scholarly impact through traditional means presumes a substantial delay from the submission to the acceptance to publication and finally to indexing. The growth and general acceptance of alternative outlets for scholarly research has led to the inclusion of such media in academic reviews. 
These user activities or alt metrics, as they are known alternative metrics, include bookmarks, tweets, forms, and blog posts. Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Reddit can then be considered. The 2011 Altmetrics Manifesto stresses the need for diversity in impact and the speed of availability. Social tagging systems include the popular Mendeley, Site You Like, and Bibsonomy. Writing in the journal of Infor Metrics, Daniel Zoller and his colleagues do indicate that alt metrics taken from different sources reflect different results or impact. Mendeley reflects an academic audience, while Twitter results would lean more toward the popular. As well as differences in measurement standards, many note the ease of manipulation. At the same time, we have to be aware of the fact that social media and alt metrics are here to stay. But the careful researcher or reviewer should consider all forms of scholarship and not just those newly developed. For peer review, altmetric data should be subject to the same evaluation as traditional metrics. Documentation by scholars and evaluation by peers should include all forms of academic output for a true picture to emerge. I was also given additional questions. First one being, in your capacity as an architectural librarian, what advice would you give early career scholars? Start early. I know it sounds like I'm talking to students, but I have seen faculty scrambling to get published too late in the game and then not able to make the best choices. Ask for help. At many universities, subject librarians can and do prepare systematic literature reviews. At the least, they can certainly refer you to the appropriate databases and research tools. New tools appear quickly. The tools you use for teaching may not be sufficient for your research. Set up a research profile. LinkedIn and Google Scholar citations are appropriate starting points. And I've indicated below a link to an article that appeared in ACSA News. I would also suggest that you create an ORCID profile, which will help you to establish a consistent scholarly identity. And I've indicated the address below. Be aware of predatory publications. Your subject librarian may be able to evaluate the publication. Look for good matches when submitting articles for publication. Review your library holdings. Look at the editorial board. Many articles are rejected simply because they do not match the journal's mission or target audience. Ask for advice, your colleagues, your subject librarian. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. If you're a good presenter, Consider starting with a conference presentation. You may meet a potential collaborator to partner with in terms of a journal article, book chapter, or even a book. What about mid-career? Well, I would suggest that you broaden the scope of your scholarly output. Look for different publication and presentation venues in order to benefit from a new set of colleagues and have your knowledge cross disciplinary boundaries. Partner up with scholars in other but related disciplines. Your research will reach a new audience and may be accepted in different journals. Add your publications to both discipline-specific repositories as well as institutional repositories. Open access is an important way to disseminate your scholarly output. What should the late career scholar consider? Document your work to preserve it for future generations. Even unpublished materials might be added to institutional repositories and benefit others. Serve as a mentor, possibly partnering with younger scholars and introducing them to the field and your colleagues. The last slide that I've included here is a brief bibliography of the sources I've consulted. Thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm the Art Architecture and Planning Librarian at the University of Buffalo. The assessment of scholarly publishing has a direct impact on institutional funding, tenure, and promotion. Citation metrics originated in the sciences but are now being incorporated into the social sciences and humanities. Architecture covers each of these categories, making it a bit harder to measure. I'm going to go over the metric tools how to find the right journal, predatory journals, self-promotion, and archiving of scholarly work. 
It is not publish or perish. It is now get cited or perish. Barbara gave an overview, a big picture of, of what citation metrics involve. I'm going to go a little deeper in some areas and expand on other topics. The traditional citation tools are skewered to the STEM field, so it makes it a bit difficult to get a clean view of what an architecture scholar's overall publication impact looks like. I'm going to briefly reiterate some of these citation metric tools. Two tools that look at the overall citation impact and academic performance of institutions, schools, and departments are academic analytics and insights. Academic analytics no longer identify where it gets its metrics from, but in the past they listed Scopus. Insights data is built on Web of Science. These next set of tools provide citation data on the author level. These tools are used to see an individual author's citation metrics. Scopus and Web of Science are great for STEM authors, but are weak in the humanities and social sciences. Harzing, Publisher, Parish analyzes citations from Google Scholar. But if you have access to Web of Science or Scopus, you can query them, although it is not done in one complete search. Harzing has more social sciences and humanities coverage because it includes book chapters, conferences, and other scholarly materials. The data can be dirty, so an extra effort is needed to clean it up. All metrics and plum metrics cover more than just article citations. These tools look at the complete picture of the author. Metrics include social media mentions, downloads, views, and other the other issue in architecture is that faculty are split between the research faculty and clinical faculty. The clinical faculty largely teach in studio, in core studio classes and study abroad programs. So there is a question of how can clinical faculty publication impact be measured to be equal to the research faculty. There are a number of resources that can overlap, but it does depend on the institution to create a criteria document for tenure and promotion for clinical faculty. Going back to the issue of architecture publications not being well served by the popular citation metric tools, architecture faculty both in research and in clinical have to leverage the publications to their favor. It can start as where the faculty publish. There is a quote unquote big question of how do you really measure the quality of a journal? It is an interesting question, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the practical resources that are available in finding the right journal and how they rank among all the other journals. These suggestions are to aid authors in the investigation of finding fitting journals for publication. Barbara went over the ASL core list, but I want to reinforce that this list is curated by architecture librarians. And as she mentioned, we spend a large amount of time on each journal title. This list will assist in identifying journals that are core to the study of architecture. Google Scholar metrics for publications rank journals published in the last five years by subject. They are ranked by their five-year age index, the age median metrics, and it's all explained in their metrics site. Stamago is a good tool to see the age index of a journal, and it provides visual graphics of the citation count breakdowns. However, it does favor the STEM fields. Another tool to use are indexes, which lead to full text searching and cited searching within journal titles. If a journal is indexed in a number of databases, it will bring more exposure to the article. Avery Index to Architecture Periodicals is a comprehensive index of architecture, conservation, sustainable design, and city planning journals. The Arts and Humanities Index is a database that's part of, of Web of Science, and you can perform a cited journal search. There are two types of journals, traditional journals and open access journals. There are pros and cons to both models. I listed some of the characteristics of the two. The most prominent is the difference in the speed in which an article is published. The directory of open access journals does not rank journals, but offers a curated list of prominent, peer-reviewed, reliable open access journals. The popularity and accessibility of online journals and open access journals has reshaped how publishers are making a profit. The cost-profit scenario has created a new model in the publishing world by allowing the establishment of predatory journals and publishers. 
These are some of the characteristics of a predatory journal. They are generally not peer-reviewed and charge author fees for publication. This practice is targeted to early career faculty because the requirement to publish and establish a scholarly presence. As I stated in the beginning, once you are published, it is important to make your article discoverable in the scholarly community. A way to accomplish this is self-promotion. ORCID is a tool for authors to have a persistent digital identifier. Some authors have a hard time distinguishing their research and citation metric tools from other authors with similar names and or abbreviations. ORCID creates a unique ID identifier. An author can add this identifier to any publication, whether it's an article, conference presentation, grant, CV, or any other research. It is different from Researcher ID because Researcher ID is integrated within Web of Science, where ORCID is open and nonprofit. Google Scholar Citations is a personal citation tracking tool. The author creates a profile and adds all their citations, mine is only one, and Google will check to see who is citing those publications. For self-promotion and archiving, most universities have institutional repositories. It is an archive for collecting, preserving, and distributing faculty research and scholarship. There are subject repositories such as Open Door, which, which is a directory of open access repositories, and Humanities Commons, which is a nonprofit organization that allows scholars to create a profile and share their work, therefore increasing their visibility. The website Sherpa Romeo is a good source to identify archiving permissions given by a journal. You can check your author's rights on the journal you are interested in publishing with. For example, the Journal of Design Studies allows you to archive preprints on any website. Postprints can be archived on an author's personal website, but you can only put it in an open access repository after an embargo period. I left ResearchGate and Academia.edu to the end because although they're social network, networking sites for researchers, there's a multitude of copyright and ethical issues surrounding these websites. Publishers are requesting the removal of articles from ResearchGate because of copyright infringement. Academia.edu is not an educational, educational or an institutional affiliated website. It is a for-profit organization. For a fee, an author can get their paper, quote unquote, recommended. Because both of these sites are for profit, there are no safeguards put in place for predatory journals or fake impact citations. So use this with caution. Because there's a noticeable increase by departments to track citations and requests from faculty for their own metrics to use in dossiers and funding, the citation metric tools are changing and evolving to become a little bit more inclusive. This is why I think Avery has a chance to be more than just an architectural index. Most, if not all, architecture schools carry the Avery index, so adding a form of citation metrics to the Avery index could solve some of the issues architecture faculty are currently facing. It's a thought. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mahabub Rashid. I'm a professor of architecture of the School of Architecture and Design at the University of Kansas. I also serve as the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies and the Director of MA and PhD programs in architecture. Today, I will talk about how to maximize your research impact in architecture. But before I move on to the next slide, I just wanted to note that the background of this slide shows a spot matrix of our school that includes our strengths, problems, opportunities, and threats. It was among many diagrams we had developed creating a framework to position ourselves as an architecture and design school of the 21st century. And as I see it, research will play a significant role toward achieving our goal. As a research administrator of a school of architecture and design, and as a researcher in architecture and design, 
I will also talk about the strategies I use to disseminate my work and to make my work more impactful. I will also talk about the need for research in architecture and finally I will spend some time talking about the future of researcher in architecture. I have published over 70 peer-reviewed articles in journals such as Critical Care Nursing Quarterly, Urban Design, Geo Forum, Environment and Planning B, the Journal of Architecture, and Environment and Behavior. I have also worked on research projects worth over $4.5 million in total. The sponsors of these projects include the NIH, the CDC, the GSA, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Steelcase, Herman Miller, and many hospitals. My primary areas of research interest have varied over the years. They include history and theory of cities, urban form and structure, urban design and morphology, environmental behavior and psychology, intensive care unit design, and theories and methods of architectural research, including space syntax. Without doubt, to some of you, this is a lot, but it didn't always come easy. Based on my own experience, I could tell you that in order to do research well, we need to have some degree of appreciation for what it means to do empirical research. And also have some degree of respect for those who choose to do empirical research in place of design research. I have also remained open-minded and flexible. I am always looking for new opportunities to do research. This may be one of the reasons why I have remained interested in more than one research areas. I have also been very patient. I would ask you to remember that it takes time to do research well. In my case, every publication I make, it takes about two to three years. So long-term planning is necessary to be a successful researcher. I often use several strategies to promote my research work. I do collaborative interdisciplinary research work, collaboration with others in social science, natural sciences, health sciences, and engineering generally improve citations uh, because they have an established culture of citing each other. Interdisciplinary collaboration also helps improve your chances for getting funded and getting published. You may want to know that I am mostly cited by environmental psychologists, healthcare professionals, urban planners, urban geographers, researchers interested in urban form and structure. Only a few of my citations come from architecture. When possible, I try to publish in journals with high impact factor. In addition to publishing papers, you should also consider publishing books, edited books and monographs. As a design researcher, you may have more freedom for publishing creative work or community-engaged scholarship in a book. I also try to attend peer-reviewed conferences. There are many peer-reviewed venues besides SESA and AIA. When possible, you should regularly attend some of these conferences. I have regularly attended the annual conference of healthcare design and environmental design research associations conference or EDRA to promote my research work. Attending these conferences helped me improve my number of citations. Generally, citations are higher among scholars who know each other and scholars presenting in the same conferences often become collaborators. To improve my research impact, I participate in different knowledge communities. All professional bodies have many knowledge communities. You should consider particip participating in gatherings of a community that is close to your interest. If a community of knowledge similar to your interest doesn't exist, you should create one. The members of such a community would generally help you most in promoting your research work. When I was a young researcher, I used to participate in established research network. Later, I hosted my own. I also have some presence in social networking websites for academics, but not a whole lot. I think there are many good reasons why you should consider using social networking websites. These websites should let you connect with colleagues, post your own publication, and track the readership of your work. They should help boost your 
prominence and prestige, perhaps even sales of your publication. They should send you notifications every day about colleagues describing to subscribing to your feed, reading your publication or posting their own research. They should be important if you are a young researcher trying to connect with others in your own fields. But you should be careful when using social networking websites, particularly regarding copyright matters. Traditionally in architecture, research was done in applied context as a part of professional practice. There are numerous examples for this. Here I have shown the Taj Mahal. The double shell dome of this structure was not invented in a day or two. It took at least a thousand years of experiment to get there. We could afford to do that because things change slowly and we had time to adjust to these changes in the past. Things are different today. New materials, new techniques, new technologies, new building typologies are being introduced more frequently. Research is needed to help us better understand and respond to these changes quickly and effectively. Today, research is again coming back to a practice domain. They are coming back not only because we want to do it, but also because clients are asking for more non-design related services such as strategic planning, facility maintenance and management, and building performance evaluation. In addition, we also have many new concerns that didn't exist in the past. Virtual space has become increasingly important in our design. Many important physical limitations that restricted humanity would soon be overcome. Machine intelligence may outsmart human intelligence. Pupil will live much longer. Robotics, 3D printing, big data, Internet of Things, all will significantly change the way we do design. So we need better and more knowledge to cope with these rapid changes. We need better tools to create new knowledge. We need better tools to help manage complex needs. We also need better knowledge to give validity to architectural practice. Nowadays, universities are also becoming a big driving force for research in architecture. If you don't know this already, using publicly available data, academic analytics provides a set of tools and metrics for evaluating faculty research performance. Most members of the American Association of Universities subscribe to academic analytics. Here I show you one of the charts one could get from academic analytics. It shows the research productivity of a program in relation to other comparable programs. Yet, I do not see how an architectural program can avoid academic analytics in a good research university. As I see, it, the need for university-wide research metrics will continue to increase in the future. Therefore, in architecture, we need to become more productive in research in the way universities understand it. Finally, I'd like to note that today, research has become a promising career to pursue in architecture. Research opportunities have grown exponentially in architectural programs around the country. We have many more options to do research than what we had 20 years back. Given today's global context, architectural research has the potential to become more impactful than ever before. I'd like to end my presentation with these two images. These are, of course, images of Houston, USA, after Hurricane Harvey. Looking at these images, I cannot help but think, how could we get it so wrong in our cities? I wonder if better knowledge and more research would help us make better cities in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, Rose, and Maboob. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Q&A session for webinar number four. 
Uh, we'll be happy to take your questions now. Um, I'll go ahead and start us off with a first question. Um, traditionally, many scholars tend to develop their uh, research in stages uh, through conference papers, evolving into journal articles, and perhaps into a book or book chapters. Is this still a valid and primary approach to research? Um, and what are some alternative paths to, to this uh, traditional approach? Perhaps we can start maybe with Rose and then go to Maboob and, and Barbara. Okay. Um, I think that is that it, that is a traditional path uh, that most scholars tend to take. Um, and as an alternative path, um, uh, maybe they would start with awards to add their um, drawings and plans and ideas for a, a, an award competition, and then that would eventually turn into a paper. I don't know. I think maybe Maboot, Maboot would probably be better at answering this, too. I agree, but I agree with the uh, competitions idea. I, I agree with both of them. I think it is still a valid way of, of, of disseminating your research. Uh, but uh, I would say that this will take a longer time uh, given the tightness of time that we, we always face here as a as a tenure track faculty, we should consider alternative ways of, of disseminating our research. And um, we should not always uh, think about turning an, an article into journal article or turning an article into a book. I think many architectural schools will be happy if you have published in peer-reviewed conference proceedings, and that would be most often considered as peer-reviewed article uh, within a university. So, and also simultaneously, you should uh, uh, work on multiple projects at the same time. You should not think linearly that let, let, let me publish one paper and then get to the next one. Um, in my case, I have said uh, most of my journal publications take at least two to three years. And if I sit that long in order for it to come out, probably I won't be able to publish much. Uh, so I do multiple projects at the same time. I send one, then start working on another one, waiting to see how it will turn out. That sounds like a very good strategy. Um, one of the things that we've mentioned competitions, but work, particularly in the technical field, working with um, you know various companies, concrete institutes, uh, particularly even local vendors, you may get something. Uh, we've had faculty who have worked uh, on uh, various um, you know minimum um, housing kind of standards in terms and using. Uh, vendors locally to um, help support the research and that again can result in a number of different ways of built work in this instance but also uh, then leading to presentations and possibly to papers so I think kind of thinking outside the box and using um, particularly um, vendors that you know we may have not thought of by uh, using commercial uh, enterprises we may have talked about society enterprises but I think commercial um, enterprises can help in the technical field in terms of funding and maybe even kind of drive helping drive the research in a particular direction. I think that's great. Uh, we got a question that was related to this about uh, professors of practice or clinical faculty. And I think you guys are beginning to already address this, uh, sort, of, sort of asking um, when your primary output is designing and delivering award-winning buildings for urban spaces, uh, what approach can one take? And I think what I'm hearing is the competitions, working with industry, um, that those are potential ways to, to disseminate that work as research. I think I, I, too. I was just going to say exhibitions. Um, again, you know, there are venues, um, not just in schools, but sometimes um, kind of um, museums or maybe a research institute may want to show particular work, um, which is not, could have been based in a competition, but may have been just kind of design output. Um, and that could be another way of getting the word out there and maybe, again, in return, find some collaborators. I would add to that, that uh, in most architecture schools, uh, engaged scholarship has become very important. 
That's true. So as, a, as a professor of practice, it is very important to get to the community, work with the community, and make local impact rather than always uh, looking outward. I think most university will value your local work, community engaged work, uh, your work to improve diversity. Um, and also working in the underserved area is a very important way to be become impactful as a professor of practice. That is definitely, that sounds yeah. like very good advice. Yeah. So you've talked about the diversity of ways that uh, faculty members can publish their work from conference proceedings to books. And now we're talking about some alternative ways of, of doing that. And it's been brought to our attention that some universities don't count certain kinds of research in the same way that others do, uh, specifically in this case, uh, not counting uh, conference papers at all. Uh, could you talk about, in your experience, um, how universities have, have dealt with uh, various ways of disseminating the content and what they value uh, relative to other kinds of modes of dissemination? I'd be surprised if conference papers weren't counted. Um, I looked at our faculty manual, and it's pretty general in terms it does not specify a number of articles or a number of different outputs, nor does it actually specify the means. I, again, social media might be different, but I would think conference proceedings would be considered academic. But again, putting them in an institutional repository might be a way of um, gaining um, you know, getting the word, both the word out there and maybe gaining some acceptance? I, I would add to that, that uh, conferences vary. They, not all conferences are the same. So, and and right. if you go to, a, you know, uh, uh, what is that uh, industrial conference or, or, or a venue for, which is mostly an expo, of course your paper won't be counted. Right. But if you go to <laughs> professional conferences, uh, you know, where uh, your colleagues are presenting papers and reviewing your papers, I don't see any reason why they should not be counted as, as uh, you know, peer-reviewed publication because it's not only one time. You are doing three levels of uh, uh, referencing there. First, your abstract is being reviewed. Right. Then your paper is being reviewed. Then you are presenting your paper in front of of your of your colleagues. So I wonder why they should not be counted. But I would also say that not all conferences are same. You should be very careful about going to conferences and then presenting your work and claiming that work to be of equal value to other conferences. Right, right. And that would be, again, the sort of uh, critical analysis of, of who is uh, hosting the conference, who is the organizer, some recognized names that you either do some research on or check with, um, you know, the value of that uh, work with um, your colleagues in the field. And I will also add to that, that, uh, you know, your conference's paper may not be accepted, but uh, the reason, the fact that you are going to a conference, working with other people of similar interest, you know, those are the people probably would be reviewing your dossier. Those are the people probably would be writing your reference letters. So uh, there are many other benefits besides just getting published in a conference proceedings. Yeah, that certainly sounds very solid advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like maybe to shift the focus a little bit on, uh, so I guess, can you speak about the role of academic scholarly impact versus social impact? Uh, how are larger societal impacts being measured and do they matter? And I'm talking about things like engaging in design advocacy, policy, um, and, and also uh, maybe more broadly thinking about uh, the potential of academics publishing in popular media. That's actually really not being counted that well, except in uh, Plum Analytics. Um, they do a little bit more in downloads and mentions, if you are mentioning in social media. Um, that is that's probably one of the biggest issues um, that I think that clinical or even uh, anybody that really wants to get out there more in the social media. I mean, you do have um, the the research gate where you, where you are academia.edu where you get you get mentioned and talked about but again um, that's not really looked at as as other citation metric tools such as web of science and scope is that's kind of a side part 
Um, although Elsevier bought Plum Analytics, so I'm not sure if that will he, that that company will actually bring that side into it into their um, databases. Yeah, that uh, Rose's answer sounds like there's nothing I could add to that. I will I will add to that a little bit more is being an administrator in a public uh, school. Uh, I would say that uh, you know we are a state funded university. Uh, state would like to see us doing projects that has public impact, and that mm -hmm. is probably yeah. most often the case that you know higher administration looks to us and say, tell us so what is important. Why, how are you contributing to the state? Uh, mm -hmm. This is definitely one side of the story that uh, never being told uh, uh, if you are a researcher looking outward. And it, it depends on university interest, uh, how university wants to see public engagement and how uh, they would like to value that. Uh, some universities, of course, would, would, would see that as important and that may not harm your tenure track at all. No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, we've had... Um, basically chancellors who have taken um, that social engagement as sort of as the same standard as, you know, kind of the academic. And I think it needs to be balanced, but certainly there are ways to work with uh, city agencies, with disability studies, um, groups like that, that um, can certainly both provide social impact, but also can, um, you know, do some good. And again, one, one way of, um, working with a particular group may kind of spring off to something else that could be, um, you know, you may find one colleague to work with or you may get funded because somebody heard something. And so it's a, kind of a cyclical process, I think. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of the webinar time. I want to ask maybe one more question. Uh, looking ahead, uh, let's say five to 10 years, uh, is architectural research being influenced by these new assessment tools and impact evaluation tools? And if so, uh, in what ways might we expect the field to change and evolve? I would hope the tools would change to support architecture. I think that humanities and social sciences, are they realize that they're not being um, seen at the same standards as the STEM fields. And so I think that the louder voice that we have, in, so to speak, that we could get, that we could change those tools to show the impact that faculty are, are having, that it's not just in the, in the citations that they get, but in other areas as well. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. And I think uh, using these uh, innovative techniques and technology uh, in a creative way, uh, to you know, improve our image uh, in the larger world probably is one of the best thing we could do. And uh, more, having more technology, more outlets available to us uh, as architects, we are creative people. We should find creative ways to use those tools. Mm -hmm. and, yes, I agree. And and I think just you know making people aware of uh, that. I think. Um, research um, is relatively new in terms of practice. I mean, counting that type of research. So for people to understand that the methodology needs to be improved and what needs to count, um, just making that maybe making people aware of that will certainly kind of um, improve um, the acceptance of alternative media as well as maybe looking for a different standard. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, Rose, and Maboub. I really have appreciated your presentations and your answers to our questions. Um, with this, I'd like to wrap up our fourth and final webinar for uh, this year's uh, TAD uh, webinar series. And thank you to our audience for joining us. If you would like to recommend this uh, video or, or see it a second time, we will be uh, posting this video on the ACSA website soon. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciated that. Yes, agreed. Yes. Definitely. Thank you.